Okay, okay. it says we're live. Very good. Uh, welcome to the Infrastructure Bond Engagement Steering Committee for Friday, March 18th. I'll call it to order. And um, who's going to call the roll? I am. There you are. Okay, Kelly. Um, Member Stapleton. I'm here. Member Hoy. Here. Member Gonzalez. Here. Chair Bennett. Here. Thank you. Very good. Uh, approval of minutes. Councilor Hoy. I move, excuse me, I move approval of the minutes. Second. Second by Stapleton. Any discussion? Okay, if you'd call the roll. Member Hoy. Aye. Member Stapleton. Aye. Member Gonzalez. Aye. Um, Chair Bennett. Aye. Thank you. Okay, minutes are approved. We'll move on then to public comment. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six folks lined up for public comment, three minutes a piece. Three minutes are up, you're done. Okay, we'll keep moving along. Jim Shepke. Jim, you're not on. Would you unmute yourself? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jim Shepke, Ward 2. I have two slides to share. And what I'm gonna use my three minutes for is to give you some good information about the cost of branch libraries. This is better information than you have in your packet on page 18. I, I found that information to uh, not be good. So this is the information I got. That page mentions Fort Vancouver Regional Library. So I went to my friends at Fort Vancouver Regional Library and I bring you what it costs them to run their branches up there. That they run a branch at White Salmon that's 9,000 square feet, 7.3 FTE, open 48 hours a week. The annual cost is $640,000. Uh, that does not include the cost of collections because they do that centrally, but it does include a lease cost of 160,000. So I think that figure of 640 is about, is about right on. That's about what it costs okay. uh, with the collection. And the Ridge, uh, they just opened a new branch, uh, Ridgeview, Ridgefield Community Library, 8,000 square feet, 4.8 FTE, 49 hours a week. And they've only been running it for seven months, so they don't know the cost, but I'm told that it's gonna be less than the 640,000, maybe more like 500,000. So that's the cost of that branch library. I also uh, bring you some cost figures for what a branch library costs in Fort Vancouver Regional Library. Um, the Ridgefield branch was $4 million and they converted an 8,000 square foot building that was donated to them. So they didn't have to buy that building, but that's how they did that on the cheap. And the Washougal Community Library is under development and they estimate that's gonna cost seven to $8 million to build a 12,000 a square foot library on donated land. So what do we need in the bond measure for Salem? I would estimate. I think we need from five to $10 million. And for that amount, we could have two new branches in the next 10 years. If it was only 5 million, we'd have to raise a lot more. We'd have to challenge our library foundation maybe to raise $5 million, but I think they could do that. So I think it's very doable for a very a modest amount of this bond measure package. And I just wanna leave you with one further thought. Oh, there it is. Uh, we can save a lot of money in Salem with our library if we use a lot more volunteers. Look at this, we're at the bottom of this list. Eugene uses twice as many volunteers, Corvallis three times as many, Beaverton four times as many, and Hillsborough is five times as many. So we can do that, we can run an economical library system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Jim? Just a sec. Uh, let's get this off the screen. See what we got going on here. Let's clear the screen again. See who all's here. You might have to go up to view and hit gallery to get all the people back on your screen, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. 
Okay, anybody got any questions? Okay, uh, Matthew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my name is Matthew Hatler. I'm a local pediatrician in Salem, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you for a minute about um, an idea to enhance uh, health and emotional wellness for our community through building mini pitches for soccer on existing uh, tennis courts by refurbishing them. So as a pediatrician, my focus uh, is helping children develop a lifetime of healthy habits. Uh, physical inactivity and obesity are risk factors for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and depression. And the most expensive preventable illness, diabetes, costs $237 billion in direct medical costs in the U.S. each year. And I think we can do better, especially in Salem, about creating a culture of prevention. So two obstacles that we have in Salem to overcome um, this is that there's long rainy winters where grass fields are waterlogged. Um, and there's also a financial barrier to participate in sports. Uh, in our country, we have a pay to play model for sports, which leaves out families who cannot afford to pay. Um, in order for, to provide an alternative to the pay to play model, I started a Facebook group called Free Soccer Salem, um, which is meant to be a place where parents can organize soccer games for themselves or their children. And it's resulted in many pickup soccer games. A few months uh, after I created this group, I became aware that there are actually two other groups in Salem for adults with the same purpose. And between the three groups, there's about a thousand members. Um, but sadly, since October, all of the soccer being played in these is at indoor places where you have to pay to play. So my proposal is that we develop small soccer courts at several city parks around Salem. Um, these have also been called mini pitches or futsal courts, which is just another word for soccer or futsal. Um, there are several tennis courts, which are approximately 100 feet by 50 feet, which would be perfect for a mini pitch capable of accommodating size of three to five players each. Um, using the already existing Facebook groups that we have, we could have an immediate ability to start coordinating pickup games. Um, and this kind of active presence in the community would visibly enhance the culture of physical activity in, the, in Salem. Um, the surface also dries quickly and it would provide year-round um, use. Um, so I've been in contact with a member of the Oregon House of Representatives who's overseeing several mini pitches in the Gresham, Oregon area. And he reports that they're very highly used. They have eight pitches currently and they're looking to add more. Um, he tells me that 80% of the time the mini pitches are used by local youth and families who simply want to play soccer. The rest of the time is typically used by local community organizations to organize competitive tournaments for local youth. Nationally, uh, the US Soccer Foundation has an initiative called Safe Places to Play, wherein they also build mini pitches. Um, they re resurface existing asphalt and concrete surfaces with a vinyl flooring, which is brightly colored and very attractive. They've done some surveys that 98% uh, of the people surveyed say that people in their community are more active. 98% say their community feels safer and 93% say their pitch serves as a community hub. Um, I have ongoing contact with these people and I'm happy to, they're also happy to uh, talk with the city of Salem to talk about what they can offer and, and what possibilities they might be able to, to do. So soccer is the most popular sport in the world. I see my time's running out. Thank people you very are... much, Matthew. Yeah. Have you had a chance to uh, speak with the um, uh, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board about this idea? You're talking about some existing facilities. I just wondered if you'd had a chance to go there. I have, I have sent emails to Rob Romanek, uh, he, who is a parks planner, I believe. Right. And he corresponded with me uh, briefly uh, many months ago. Um, at that point, I had presented him with a multi-purpose uh, kind of idea. Um, and we had a brief exchange, but then I emailed him again a couple months later and did not have any further contact with him. Okay. I, I would just suggest, along with talking to us, I, I think this is going to be uh, uh, more appropriately brought to them uh, for, for uh, action in a tighter time frame. I mean, it, you're, you're making a really interesting uh, idea. I have no idea what our tennis court youths like and, you know, do we want to replace tennis courts with pitches? I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's really, uh, really interesting. I think we've been, uh, really looking at other like pickleball is getting the courts, you know, that kind of thing. So I would really recommend if you have a chance uh, uh, and maybe uh, somebody can help uh, uh, Matthew out is to help him make contact with those guys, get to one of their meetings and talk about this idea. This is a, I think a really interesting idea. 
Right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And with the mini pitches, it'd be easy to bring a portable pickleball court and line it for pickleball too. And so you could do sure. the same on the same surface. Yeah. 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 No, that's a, a really interesting idea. Thank you very much for, for testifying. Thank you. Uh, Lori Doherty. Um, Mayor Bennett and members of the committee, my name is Lori Doherty. I live in Ward 1, and I'm speaking on behalf of 350 Salem, Oregon, the local chapter of International Climate Justice Network 350.org. Salem has a once-in-a-lifetime convergence of two crises, climate change and housing, together with a rare opportunity for taking substantial measures to address them. Every community improvement project must be evaluated using an equity lens and a climate lens and must be aligned with Salem's climate goals. The Climate Action Plan and our Salem provide guidance on meeting these goals. The Community Improvement Bond offers an important means to achieve them. Salem is in dire need of more housing, particularly for low-income people. New housing should be energy efficient, all electric, and located in compact mixed-use neighborhoods near public transit. As well as reducing climate changing emissions, this can reduce household energy and transportation costs. Transportation is Salem's major source of greenhouse gas emissions. To achieve meaningful greenhouse gas reduction, Salem must reduce vehicle miles traveled with infrastructure improvements that foster alternatives to using motor vehicles. Roadway related expenditures must be directed toward traffic calming, improved safety and convenience for walking, biking and use of mobility aids and access to public transit. Salem does not need more streets or wider streets. Salem needs sidewalks, protected bike lanes, bike boulevards, and traffic signals sighted and timed for the safety of people who are not in cars. Other projects should also be evaluated using a climate, and climate lens. One example is fire department expenditures. Firefighters are real heroes. However, most calls on them are medical. Sending both fire trucks and ambulances is wasteful. Um, Wasteful and unnecessary. Salem needs more ambulances well deployed around the city to respond to medical emergencies. This will save fuel, save wear and tear on fire trucks, reduce diesel pollution, and ensure that firefighters are available for fighting fires. Another example is the request for new libraries that you just heard in underserved parts of the city, as well as education and information resources, libraries are centers for community gatherings and events. Conveniently located branch libraries reduce the need to drive in town to the main library. We know that climate change is already causing harm and imposing heavy costs, and the time frame for effective action is short. The Community Improvement Bond is a real opportunity to address this crisis. Please don't waste it. I also want to refer the committee to detailed written comments from Bob Courtright that were just submitted this afternoon as he points out some projects have other sources of funding available. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Lori? Thank you, Lori. Uh, Lyle Mordhurst. Oh, thank you for allowing me in today. Um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, Marine Drive. I know with this bond measure, you're going to be looking at roads and stuff. And back in early 1990s, when ODOT decided they're going to make Marine Drive a four lane road, at that time, they said, let's look at alternative things. So they came with Marine Drive, which is east of all of the apartments that are down Wallace Road. And then again, in the, in the mid 90s, when they recognized and West Salem didn't have enough maximum housing, they agreed to place all the apartments on Wallace Road with Marine Drive being to the east side of it, running north and south parallel with Wallace Road to give access to all of those people and residents in those apartment buildings to the post office, the library, grocery stores, all the amenities without putting more pressure on Wallace Road. It was just a great all around plan. Um, today, I'm coming to ask you is with this bond measure, I think that'd be a great time to bring Marine Drive back to be that collector street it hooked from Glen Creek Road and run up eventually to Riverbend. Um, it is a collector width with a separated bicycle pedestrian pathway east of it. So young families or people that are walking or bicycling can jump onto that pathway and never cross the street and go all the way down to Middle Brown Island. So it is a total full package that, rep that represents not only congestion relief, but it removes cars, gives more people safe bicycle access um, to downtown and amenities like that. Um, I know I've got three minutes, but at the same time, I'd love to answer some questions if there's any there. 
I've served on many committees and this, even in 2018, when the city ran the, their own study for relief congestion, this was the number one. I see Chris has got a question for me. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mort or Commissioner Mordhurst for coming on and talking to us today. I don't know if you're aware of it, but you know, council has made Marine Drive a priority and we've been purchasing property and right of way in anticipation of building Marine Drive. Because as you, I served on that congestion relief task force that you just referenced, and it is a, one of our number one priorities in terms of being able to reduce congestion. So uh, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to make sure you were aware that we have been purchasing right of way. And we, I think this council has full intention of uh, building it just as soon as we can. So thank you. That's great news and thank you. And I knew we bought right away with the rest of that first bond. I just wasn't sure where it stood today. I, Rumors is Bicycle Bass or Patterson Park, and and that's all I've heard. No roadways, so great. Oh news. no, we purchased. We just re recently purchased several more parcels. In fact, over in West Salem uh, for Marine Drive, uh, we have I don't know how many we have now, but we've purchased quite a few of them. Excellent. And, and the full intent is to move forward on construction of Marine Drive in this bond measure. Is that is that correct, Chris? Then by this committee. Well, I don't know, but I, we haven't talked about that yet, but that would be my intent. Okay. Well, that's two. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. What do we got next? We have Tim Clark. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor committee and staff members for allowing me to speak today. Uh, just hearing from what uh, Commissioner Moorhorst and Chris Hoy talked about Marine Drive. And that was my focus today to bring your attention that Marine Drive has always been a, uh, an issue or not issue, but Wallace Road being an issue of congestion and Marine Drive is one of the alternatives. Uh, back in the early 80s, uh, I served on the West Salem Neighborhood Plan Com Steering Committee, and that was uh, a lot of things were happening at that time. Wallace Road was widening, and uh, they were putting mediums, and like uh, Commissioner Mortars talked about, is another way for people not to just turn left on Wallace Road, cross two lanes, but to uh, jump onto Marine Drive and head down to the commercial and retail area in West Salem, and also uh, connectivity uh, to cherish the uh, Wallace Marine Park, uh, what it has to offer to the community too. Um, the concern was, yes, uh, we had, back then we had to identify 130 acres of multifamily, and that was along uh, Wallace Road from River Bend down to if you're familiar to the 7-Eleven, which is near the Orchard Heights area. And so taking that on, uh, the committee was looking at uh, ways of trying to get people off Wallace Road uh, and Marine Drive was one of the ways of doing that. Um, the idea behind it is, uh, uh, was our one of our main concerns, uh, the other, uh, things that we had to deal with was uh, location of the high school, but it happened to change up on top of the hill instead of down in that area. Uh, again, uh, Wallace Road is being congested, even with the extra lanes. Now this has another opportunity to get West Salem people from the north down into the commercial and retail area without uh, jumping on Wallace Road. So. Uh, Chris, that was very promising that you talked about the purchase of properties to help out with this issue. Uh, and hopefully everyone else on the committee will uh, move forward with that uh, project. And so again, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, that'd be great. If not, uh, 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 please consider Marine Drive as a number one priority. Yes, Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, again, I don't have so much of a question um, as, you know, stating my my intention. I would love to see that Marine Drive come through. I think it will open up access to 
all of that area for housing and hopefully some affordable housing. Um, and that bike infrastructure is going to be so key for us as we move forward uh, with climate action. Um, and that would just really open up West Salem. I, I have been working on some plans with some friends, just envisioning what West Salem, what Salem as a whole could look like with really substantial bike infrastructure. And that Marine Drive is really a key piece for West Salem for bike infrastructure and, and even pedestrian um, infrastructure. As you look at access to the park and access to that Union Street Bridge, um, it really is going to be, I think, necessary as we move forward. And, and so I'm looking forward to seeing that and having discussions with this committee as well as with council about how we move forward with that project. Thank you. I said thank you and I appreciate it, yes. And with that Marine Drive, it, it brings the people from the, you know, the residents from the north side where we got Edgewater and everything grabbing the people from down below. Let's grab the people from the north side to be able to enjoy that connectivity. Yes, and I would love to find a way to connect those. I would love to see an at street crossing there at second. Um, so that's in my dream. So I hope that, uh, you know, that's something we can look at too. Great. Hey, any other? All right, thank you very much. Uh, Victor Godier. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor Bennett and committee members. Uh, I'm Victor Dodier, and I'm appearing today as uh, chair of SCAN's Transportation Committee. I will report on a resolution that the SCAN board uh, passed unanimously at its um, March 9th meeting. We submitted the um, resolution in written comments uh, for this meeting, so I will paraphrase. Um, SCAN requests that the board include funding for the following categories of transportation projects. Uh, sidewalk repair, this should be money uh, to repair, rehabilitate and bring sidewalks along city streets up to a good condition in a reasonable time frame. Uh, tier one bicycle projects, this should be money to complete the tier one bicycle projects that are already planned in the Salem transportation plan but are otherwise languishing for lack of funding. Pavement preservation, a significant portion of the bond proceeds should be devoted to street pavement preservation projects. The Church Street Bridge Project, um, funding for repair and rehabilitation of the historic uh, Church Street Bridge over Pringle Creek. Uh, a road diet for Liberty Street South, um, the traffic speeds along the traffic speeds along Liberty Liberty Street South north of Superior are far in excess of the 30 mile an hour speed limit, um, and, and pedestrian crossings to support mixed use development. Safe and convenient pedestrian crossings will prevent the arterials from becoming barriers. Uh, they will support the mixed use development zone along arterials that are envisioned in our Salem Comprehensive uh, Plan update. The Commercial Street South in SCAN is an example of such an arterial. I wish that the staff recommendation on bicycle, pedestrian, and street projects had been available sooner. Uh, the SCAN transportation would have had an opportunity to review and comment on it. Based on my quick review, I see some echoes of SCAN's requests in the staff recommendation, safer pedestrian crossings, and the Church Street bridge railing over Pringle Creek are examples. I will note that I think that the State Street project at $14 million may be misclassified as a bicycle and pedestrian project. And finally, um, I will conclude that the SCAN board also adopted a resolution in support of branch libraries at its January meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Victor. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. That's all the public comment I have signed up. So we'll move on to our update, communication and engagement, Barney and Worth. All right. Is that you? That's me, Mayor. Right. Libby Baki with um, Barney and Worth. Give me a second here. I need to 
pull up the presentation. Okay, and then I'm gonna ask the question we're all used to, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So um, as part of our assignment, uh, we took a look at similar multi-objective capital measures um, presented to voters um, for consideration in five peer communities. So these five communities we looked at, and I just wanted to point out a couple of things, um, except for Las Cruces, all of these cities are much larger than Salem. Um, also, as expected, they all have different election laws. So we'll see that they use a multiple measure approach um, that, but they're required to present it that way. So I just wanted to say that isn't a strategy. They, they must um, present them separately. Um, they all use accountability and reporting methods back to their, um, every single one of them, either in the measure or of their own will. They are sharing with, um, with the community the um, results of, the, of their work they're doing to implement the projects. Um, they all did a great job of showing voters what they're buying well ahead of the measure. So all of the measures are well described and um, they, they're using engaging methods to share that with voters. And um, exciting for us, or when we were looking through this, you'll see the results of the poll show that communities, these communities have an appetite to support these community livability um, measures. And um, some of them are voting on a second set of them. So it's not just a one-time thing. All right, I'm gonna change slides. Okay, we're gonna start in Albuquerque. Um, you can see this one's branded uh, one Albuquerque. Voters approved 11 measures for a variety of capital improvements, totaling 110 million. You can see here um, that all of them, um, they're so close. They voted yes, so many people voted yes on each and every one of these to the same measure, 70% um, plus. Only one um, failed and that was a public stadium. Let's see, the next one is Denver, Colorado. Um, this one is branded Denver Rise. Um, voters passed four of five bundled bo um, bond measures to maintain and expand the city's infrastructure for a total of 259 million. And this is one that followed on a 2017 passage of a $937 million bond package that was branded Elevate Denver. Um, around half of the total of this um, bond was um, earmarked to cover deferred maintenance. We're gonna zoom down to El Paso, Texas. Um, El Paso in um, 2012 and again in 2021 passed a bond measure. Here, here they branded it Building Tomorrow Together. In 2012, voters overwhelmingly approved two quality of life bond measures to improve parks, pools, community centers, revitalize and upgrade museums, libraries, and build a new um, children's museum and multi-purpose arena. Um, this one of note, um, it was supported by the Chamber of Commerce and the El Paso Tomorrow Political Action Committee um, played a big role in getting the word out. And in uh, 2021, the El Paso City Council approved an additional 141 million in geo bonds um, to complete some of these projects. All right. The next one, a neighbor of El Paso, uh, the city of Las Cruces in 2018, in a special mail ballot election, voters approved four geo bond measures totaling 35 million. And that included park improvements, a sports field, an animal shelter, a replacement fire station and recreation trails. We're gonna come back closer to home. Um, this was just very recent, Seattle Public Schools um, placed two levy renewals 
on the February um, 2022 ballot. Both measures received over 75% yes votes. Um, and you can see the second one there is a bundled um, fund students, staff computers, technology systems, building repairs, and a renovation of a stadium. Um, taken as a whole, you know, thinking about um, community livability improvement um, measures, one I thought it was it was very exciting to see that people understood that that these things bundled together um, would make significant improvements in their livability of their communities. Um, of note, you can see most of them are branded. They've done a really good job of showing voters what they're buying. So the projects are well described. Um, it helps people understand what they're buying. So it um, increases enthusiasm, highlights the importance of having a discrete set of projects as soon as possible to show voters um, what they'll get. Um, also, there's a lot of engagement with partners and the community in developing the project list. Um, again, early, I said they all are providing assurance of accountability of the funds. Um, uh, you look at the project list, they have a lot of community-wide benefits. And uh, again, they just used a lot of engaging graphics, and videos, and materials to, to share. All right. Very good. Thank you. Any questions? No. Oh, I'm sorry, Levy, were you done? I think Libby was finished, but I think we were just taking questions just as you were, Mayor, thank you. Okay, any questions? Yeah, Virginia, what? Yeah, thank you. I was wondering what the benefits were, um, or if there are benefits to uh, kind of bundling these this bond up. Like right now, it's just one big bundle, and it's either up or down, whether you hate or love all of it. Um, and I, what I'm seeing in these examples is that they're they've really split these out, right? You know, I could see definitely public safety being one, or infrastructure being another, and then you know, I love this idea of quality of life type. Um, approach for, you know, I, for me, I imagine libraries or parks being in that. So what is the, I guess we don't have to do that. I know that we don't have to, you know, kind of bundle them all out individually, but is there a, a pro to doing something like that? Are you asking, sorry, I must have dropped off for a second, but I'm back. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, did, I, I heard your question. I heard are, your are question. Are you saying, Virginia, yeah. just to have you explain it, are you yeah. saying break up the bond measure into discrete pieces and take them out all at once like four ballot measures or what are you thinking? Well, I'm just trying to imagine what the ones that we were just discussing, what did those look like? Did they look like that? You know, were they all on one voters pamphlet, you know, kind of broken up into, do you want to do a bond for this and that and the other? And people, it looks to me, were able to vote yes for some and no for others. Um, I'm just curious to know if there is benefits to that, even if you don't have to do that legally, because I'm, I'm understanding that those other cities had to do that legally. Um, did they all have to do that legally or um, did some of them choose to break it out like that? It, it appears that they all were required to break them out. Um, but I would say if you look down, they, they broke them out, but um, um, you can see that people voted 74% of people voted yes on almost every single one of them. So there is an outlier with stadiums. Um, so um, anyway, I, I, I don't think that that is a strategy. I guess I'm saying in my professional opinion, I don't believe that was a strategy to improve their overall odds of, of winning. Okay, thank you. Also, yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. If I might just add to um, so much of, I think, how a community forms or shapes a bond is a reflection of the community. And, and in our particular case, um, the primary message that holds well and um, encourages support among the electorate is the idea that we have up to 300 million that we can obligate without changing your tax rate for the next 10 years. If we were to change the way the 
categories are presented on the ballot, that part of the message is no longer valid. It changes the dynamic in our messaging quite a bit. Does that make sense? Um, if, if we know that the primary reason people are compelled to support this kind of an investment is because they are not going to be, we're not going to be bringing another bond back over a 10-year cycle. We're able to keep their rates constant and we can do all of these things collectively. If that's the primary reason to support the bond, it really changes the messaging framework and a bunch of other things um, to, to, to take a different tactic, if that helps. Okay. Any other questions on this then? All right, so we'll move on then to the uh, discussion of the bond criteria and composition. So what we're doing is starting the process of putting together the bond measure, uh, both its scope uh, and uh, maybe looking at some criteria for how we would package it up or how you would like to kind of pull pieces together or take them apart, whatever you'd like to do. Chris? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would like to make a comment in general. I, I talked with staff last night. I am hoping today is all about discussion and exploring ideas and understanding all of this because we have, we've had all this material for less than 24 hours and I haven't wrapped my head around it yet in terms of being able to make a decision, but I, I would really like to discuss it and to understand more about what some of the thinking is on some of these ideas before we then have yeah. a discussion about And that's that why I, I went down to the uh, next discussion item, prepare recommendation to council for bond scope and projects. That, it doesn't mean we have to vote the projects out, but it gives you a chance to talk about uh, no, I understand you all did not have time to, to read some of the materials and may have missed materials you've received earlier. So uh, we'll, we'll plan on another meeting maybe next week or, or very soon. We want to get this going. We, we're running out of time here. So um, if, do you have any thoughts on kind of scope or how to package it? Let me give you one. Okay, I'll, I'll kind of kick this off because I, I, we've I've had a chance, maybe a little more time to think about it, but uh, I am really interested in, uh, because we're talking about a couple of fire stations, uh, we're going to be doing some property acquisition, looking at potentially co-locating some of our city projects like branch libraries and uh, a fire station uh, or branch, branch excuse me, branch library, a fire station with a neighborhood park uh, in the same vicinity, but using this opportunity to buy property for multi-purposes. I've thought that might be a way to really move forward uh, on the branch. Plus, uh, we're, uh, fortunately, uh, the um, fire station locations are in the area that I think most of us think we need a branch library. So. Chris, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I like that idea of, of, of co-locating things. In fact, um, Ms. Rutherford and Ms. Utes and I were sp speaking this morning and talking about the possibility of branch libraries in a mixed use with uh, affordable housing up above. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's got a really, I know that's done in some other cities and I think that's a really attractive way to do it. So you can kind of take advantage of uh, costs and, and um, yeah. I think I think it's a really good idea. If if I yeah. oh sorry, I'm sorry, Councillor Stapleton. Um, it, uh, sure, okay, I'll go. Um, I oh, also <laughs> put your hand up. You gotta go. Yeah, I didn't want to. Uh, if Courtney wanted to address oh, Chris's you're comment, up. you're the elected. You talk. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, before I went to Hawaii, I took the time to read through the packet for our last meeting. Uh, when I got back, I um, sat and got to watch you guys for an hour and a half. That was brilliant. Um, and so I did actually have some questions that kind of tie into this and that came from that meeting. And, and one of them was this idea of affordable housing and sheltering put together. And I thought maybe some of that uh, negativity that we were gaining in the polling from that topic 
was not so much about affordable housing. I think everybody understands the need for affordable housing, but I think maybe some of the trigger was coming from the word sheltering. And I spoke with Kristen about this earlier today um, and, and just talking about how um, I think that sheltering can get a, a bad um, reaction um, from both quote unquote ends of the spectrum um, because sheltering is not a fix for homelessness. And so we get folks who are not interested in putting in more money into temporary fixes or band-aids. They want to see more affordable housing um, or more public housing. Um, and so I, I would hope that we could kind of lose that idea of sheltering and just kind of make that all about affordable permanent housing. Um, and can I just keep going? I have a couple of different things. Oh, you yeah. want to just stop? Okay. Um, the other thing that was talked about in the meeting was this idea about the IT um, being maybe not something that was bond material, the uh, cybersecurity. I thought that was really interesting and something that maybe we should think on a bit because they were saying it changes so fast, right, that we would maybe need to look for other sources of funding for that. And I thought that was um, really interesting and something I wanted to learn more about. Um, and two more things. One of them was the idea that the fire stations are separate from the fire apparatus. And, and I guess on a pie chart, when I'm, I'm looking at it, I see fire once and then you circle back around and you see fire again. And I'm wondering if maybe those two things should be combined um, to one kind of clean up the pie. Um, and I, I don't know, just uh, for me, I think folks would say, okay, yes, I, I understand the need for that. And then move on to the next thing and not circle back to fire, but just, you know, admit all the need that fire has. Um, and then lastly, um, one of the things that I noticed in our handout today is that for parks, there really was quite um, a lot of money dedicated to parking lots for parks and actually 6.5 million in there for parking lots. And I'd like to see that uh, drastically reduced um, to hopefully use that money for actual parks. And I know folks have to get to there, um, but I also know I didn't really see anything there for you know the sidewalks or the bike trails that lead to those paths. So if we are looking at and listening to the public comment that's coming in, how are we addressing the needs to access the parks from all from a multimodal standpoint instead of just parking lots? Those would be my my comments at the moment. Okay. Anyone else? Um, one project I want to I want to just because uh, it, it the idea is kind of the scope. Do, do you feel that the scope is wrong? I mean, does this need to be pulled in from 300 million? Is it, is it too big? Is it too much stuff? Everyone's comfortable with the size of it uh, and the amount of, of pieces. Yeah, Chris. I'm very comfortable with the size. I think it's a good strategy with the flat uh, tax rate. Okay. I don't have my head wrapped around yet the scope because I don't, I'm not sure where we're at yet. So um, okay. I'm fine with, I'm very comfortable with the, the amount. Well, the, the categorical scope, are you comfortable with that? Do you feel okay with, we're yeah. talking about, uh, uh, Virginia mentioned IT. We also have parks. We also have streets and bridges. We have, are you okay with those multiple categories? Is that everybody okay so, those? I, I'm, in general, I'm okay with it. I, are my, personally, okay. my my feelings about the IT stuff, I think, are consistent with the polling. Interestingly, it that seems more like an operational cost that we ought to be budgeting for. And I get that it's a big it's a big lift, but I would hate for something like that that I that I personally feel is more of an operational cost to tank this whole thing. <laughs> so because it's yeah. not so popular in the in the polling either. So. Um, sorry, yeah. Krishna, but, um, and I know it's critical. I'm not suggesting it's not critical. That's not it at all. It's just, I just don't know if this is the place to fund it, but I'm comfortable with all the, with the other scope of it. Yeah. Krishna, does this include the IT part include broadband at some level in this community beyond, I mean, what, what are we doing here? Yeah, Mayor, it doesn't. It does not include the broadband. Okay. And I'll go ahead and explain. I think um, so. There are. I think if you could explain it, Christian, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but explain it in terms of a uh, uh, a public benefit. What yeah. what's that look like? That I think that's what we need to be able to understand in terms of of packaging it up. Is public yeah. benefit. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think there are two uh, main issues that we are addressing through this. And one of the things with the cybersecurity is some of our enterprise level systems are really old. They're like 24, one of them is 24 years old. So, so it's kind of time to replace. And also, uh, so it is to me, like it's kind of an infrastructure replacement that we have to do through an application. So that would allow us to kind of bring systems that are much more secure. Like, um, and then also we currently do not have any disaster recovery site, a true disaster recovery site. In case of a cyber attack, okay. then we do want to have a, a, a backup site where we can have all the systems up and running. So there are two things that we are addressing through this. Um, and so the, the reason why we are in this situation, we could never get this on the operational budget because it's, 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 it's big. It, you know, the cost to replace the systems is not small. The, the disaster recovery portion is, has a, you know, a resonance to it. What, uh, how much of, if you were to kind of break the piece apart, what's that look like? What, what are the two parts look like? I understand the 24, I, I sat on the budget committee doing the Oracle updates year after year after year, which was just unbelievable stuff to do, <laughs> wildly expensive and, and an operational drag on the city. Um, but those are, those are kind of our fiscal problem, but what about the disaster recovery? What's that look like? What's yeah, and I, I don't know, Josh, if you can kind of explain hey. some of the cost, I think the, go ahead, Courtney. Well, Krishna, I was just gonna suggest that I think what we're learning from this conversation is that we could bring back next time this group gets together a little more detail around some of that, which is also okay. feedback we've been hearing from the messaging. So we've been working on, on refining okay. that piece. But what I was wondering is um, if we could just sort of use, use the remaining time to, um, to provide more of an update on what you are seeing in these um, beautiful spreadsheets that staff have been spending some time on in terms of trying to get uh, a rough sense of the cost of the projects. And then we've tried also to identify some of the key benefits of this kind of an investment um, along the uh, right-hand side of the, of the spreadsheet. And just for entertainment purposes this afternoon, we, we can um, add things to the list and take them off in, in real time. So you can see what um, what the impact is of adding some projects and removing others, just as an exercise to kind of get a sense of what the these dollar volumes really mean or what these investments really mean. So if it's okay with you, um, we would like to just kind of walk through maybe the parks section first to get a handle on what we're, what we're looking at. Um, and then we can talk through some of the streets and sidewalks projects. But the, the real purpose of our time together, we hope, and not today, but at, at some point soon, is to, is to build a really solid recommended list of projects in those two areas. Those, again, are the flexible areas. Remember, the, the streets and sidewalks can flex to whatever need. And we've clearly shown that um, everyone in our community is aware we have much bigger need than we have capacity to fund. And so that's kind of one of our key challenges. And on the park side, we have a great list of investments from the community, and it sounds like you may wish to adjust which things might be above the line and below the line. And so that's the kind of input we were, we were hoping for today. And then we can return to you at your next conversation with an update or better information about the IT section. Um, we can talk in greater detail about affordable housing versus sheltering and, and whether that impacts um, the, the poll results for the, for the measure overall. Um, and then we can talk about messaging in general. But if it's okay with you, we could just take a couple of minutes and, and give you a sense of what's going on in this, in this parks section of the spreadsheet. And then we can go into the streets and sidewalks portion. And one of the pieces of feedback I note about streets and sidewalks is what happens if we put Marine Drive in above the line? What happens to the rest? And, and so we can have those kinds of conversations, if that's okay. Just sort of a, um, um, a tool to, to help us think about it, not make any decisions today unless you're, unless you're ready. And for your awareness, as you're going through this discussion, we have time on this coming Monday, 
And there's also time on the 28th. So you could choose to come back and revisit this further either on the 21st or the 28th to have an additional conversation and start talking about decisions. So you're, what you're asking us to do is to start to okay projects. Is what you is that kind of what you're? No, thinking t- today it's more walking through the process, so you can get information, some information about the project and kind of what some of the trade offs would be. Okay, well, parks sounds like a good place to start. We all like parks. Uh, we're all for the kids. Um, where is the property acquisition portion in parks? Is there any property acquisition in parks? Josh, would you mind pulling up the sheet so we can walk through it? Um, and and I, I want to just sort of reiterate some of the, the key themes that we've been hearing in the feedback. And is there property them. acquisition in the parks? Is there anything um, there? The, no. the key themes and messages were really to focus on taking care of what we have okay. and not doing a lot of big acquisition. But if the committee wants us to explore acquisition, we can certainly change the projects to, to reflect that. Okay. Okay, just wondered. Okay, we're to parks. What do you want to do here? So, Brian, would you mind just guiding us a little bit through the the tool and how we're using it? Sure, absolutely. Um, as, as Courtney mentioned, we we're primarily focused on uh, maintaining these existing parks that we have and improving them and okay. you know, trying to find ways to uh, look for uh, revenue generation, you know, things we could add that would actually help us improve uh, how parks looks and and one of the reasons we didn't focus on new parks so much with this with this list you're looking at and we can always change it is our staff is limited with how how much we can maintain and so adding new parks actually increases operational costs too the more we add the more people we have to add to maintain them so uh, that was one thing we looked at the other thing is when it comes to new parks if we choose to go there and and could maintain them in the future sdcs are a great funding source for uh, purchasing new parks and parks SDCs is an actually uh, pretty fluid fund. Uh, we do have uh, good amounts of revenue there. Uh, the operational side is where we really struggle with trying okay. to maintain the ones we have. So um, we really broke it out into multiple areas. Uh, we had athletic courts, which we heard the gentleman talk about uh, the sports courts and transforming into uh, you know soccer fields or, or not fields, but soccer courts and some of the other Items. So we allocated funding in that area. Uh, Councillor Stapleton saw the uh, the parking lot um, upgrades we were proposing, and again, we we kind of had a bucket for parking lots. You know, we could decrease that bucket. We we picked out the ones we thought were most important. Uh, we have a, a a line item for paths and trails, and so that again is a bucket. We we put four million in that bucket, and what that four million gets you is about. Uh, 25% of the existing 32 miles where you could actually upgrade it, knowing that uh, we do need to uh, replace trails that are failing and upgrade them so they're safe and not tripping hazards. So again, we put a bucket there. Uh, we added a bucket of 6 million for playground facilities, and that gets you about 10, 10 parks getting replaced with playground facilities. Uh, because we were trying to stay around a $35 million mark, we separated out 10 additional parks and we, we put it in a separate bucket that if you wanted to pull those in, we could we could easily spend 12 million over the, the 10 years up, upgrading playground facilities on 20 parks. Uh, restrooms was another area we thought really needed some help. And so we identified multiple restrooms uh, where we'd like to see improvements go in. And uh, we picked the, the highest priority ones as you can see, highlighted. And then shelters was another another area that came up. And uh, not only are shelters good for, for residents and you know holding events, but they're also revenue generators. So we can actually rent out shelters. And so uh, we felt that that would be a good category uh, to cover. And then uh, the next category we hear, we have our sports field upgrades. So at Gear Park, we're looking at upgrading the two baseball fields and two soccer fields at McKay. Uh, likewise, I think we have two soccer fields there. And then at Orchard, Hyde, Orchard Heights Park, we have uh, two baseball fields that could all use renovation. So, you know, with trying to fit within 
our goal, which was around 35 million, those were the top projects that we came up with. And then below the line, we have similar projects in other parks. Uh, it's really the same type of work, but it's uh, just different different parks we'd look at. Uh, Brian, I had a question on um, the life of park equipment because we're talking about a ten year bond. Yes. Uh, what What is your expectation of the life of park equipment? Um, yeah, I. I have, we have Jennifer Keller on the call, who's our park supervisor. She would have a little bit better input. Jennifer, could you answer that? Sorry. So, so what type of infrastructure are you referring to when you say that the life of, uh, of the, uh, the amenities in the parks? Are you well, I'm just, just basing it on what you all are saying about playground facilities. I don't know what you all include in that. So, uh, but what's the life of whatever that is? I mean, are these 10 year so, swings or 20 year swings, or are we, have we got some five year olds that'll be replaced in five years? Do you see what I mean? How is that phase? Right. So preponderance of our playground equipment is close to about 20 years old. So it's the standards have changed with regard to um, uh, playground requirements and safety aspects. And so we've tried to replace a playground or two each year, but you can see by the, the cost of them that that's difficult to, to make a lot of headroom. So there was a long period of time where there was not much maintenance done. And so you really have, once they're replaced, you really have a pretty lengthy, as long as they're maintained and, and addressed. Um, each year we perform inspections uh, throughout the year, quarterly on it, on playground equipment. So as long as they're, they're maintained um, at a consistent level, that life increases. But, uh, but a good share of our playgrounds are, are, are at least 20 years old. So they're, they've pretty much exhausted their, their um, useful life. Does this then, this amount of money uh, or level of service, does that kind of catch us up or what, what, what is your, what's going on there? Does so that mean if we catch up and then maintain or what kind of, what do you got in mind here? So these are full replacement playgrounds. We, uh, on a regular basis, will replace out particular pieces of equipment within a playground structure if it's failing or there's safety issues. But these are full playground replacements. These are all playgrounds that are extremely old and again have okay. uh, safety considerations. Um, so it is, these are all full playground uh, replacements, not just hodgepodge pieces of equipment. But you can, so you'll be able to do this and then maintain our other playgrounds using operational funds. Is that how I understand it? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. But this brings us mm -hmm. up to, this takes us through the next decade of playgrounds. Yes, we, we feel that if we could do, uh, certainly if we did all 20, I mean, as, as Brian mentioned, we kind of put it in a priority, the top 10 playgrounds huh. um, that there, that, and then the second tier of playgrounds replacement. If we were to replace all 20, as I mentioned over the last few years, we've replaced some, so they still have a good useful life. Um, that any that were left would be lower priority play, playgrounds that we would be able to incorporate those replacements within um, either the CIP um, or our operating budget to be able to, to uh, do those replacements. So this would certainly be the preponderance of, of dealing with our, our kind of backlog deficiency on playgrounds. Great, thank you. Jose? Thank you, Mayor. You know, a couple of questions. Um, I know that um, this list here, for example, is it um, is it based maybe one of three things? Is it based on you know going out to the community, getting feedback? Is it just uh, uh, the, the list that's been there for the most part, but we're you know we're finally looking at a little deeper, or is this sort of like a bigger vision of wanting to make sure Salem is better fit for families, tourism? Like, is there a strategy behind this whole um, list? Then I have another question, but just. Councilor Gonzalez, if I may, the, the project list um, has been generated by Neighborhood Advisory Board and Community Briefings. We also consulted with Salem Kaiser Transit District uh, around ADA options, the school district about safe routes to school ideas. And then there are, this also reflects, particularly as it relates to parks, 
some of the ideas that have been generated as we've been doing individual master plans for parks. And so this is an attempt to get to some of those um, wonderful project ideas that we have had recently and in past recent years um, to help build uh, projects that, that really meet community needs and expectations um, around an individual park area. Very helpful. So it's a little bit of everything. So it sounds like a little bit. Yeah. I, um, with regards to the Fisher Road develop, Park development, that's a, it's one of the big ones here. It's obviously here in uh, Warp 5. The, um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because what I've been hearing from my neighbors is improving Northgate Park, getting bathrooms there. You know, so I, I want to know um, if you heard or why, why Northgate wasn't included um, um, or what is it about Fisher Road that is demanding this much money? Yeah, I think when staff was looking at it and all the requests, uh, it just jumped out as an area that could use development. It's, you know, it's, it's really underdeveloped at this point in time. And, uh, you know, staff felt it would be a good one if we were to go ahead and develop a new park to actually uh, have some of those new improvements incorporated. It would just be a phase one. So it's really looking at, you know, uh, walkways and playground equipment and, uh, I think we're looking at a shelter there and a few other amenities, but uh, it's not a full blown development in its entirety. I, I, Rob Romanek is on the call. He could maybe talk about the Northgate Park, but this was one that rose to the top for, for staff. And I believe part of that came from public input. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Rob Romanek, Parks Planner. Uh, I will just add that Fisher Red Park is uh, in an area of the city that we identify as unserved by neighborhood parks. So this would be a basic development to expand our service areas out there. Um, if with regard to Northgate Park, um, this list you know, presents several buckets. And, and so I, I don't, I think it's yet to be seen that, that there could be some investments focused toward Northgate Park, if that makes sense. So if you know, look at um, renovating multi-use courts, for example, that, that could possibly um, make its way to Northgate Park. No, I appreciate the information, Brian, Rob. I appreciate it. You know, I just, I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe the right people didn't, you didn't approach the right people or you didn't hear from them. But I know that at the Neighborhood Association, at the Hallman Neighborhood Family Council, I mean, they're they're on me about Northgate Park. And so I just wondered, I was just interested in that. I, I didn't see that anywhere, knowing that at least the people that have been pretty involved in trying to raise. Now, Fisher Road Park, I mean, that's, like you said, is it un, it's undeveloped. But right now, you know, the um, I don't think there's a great sidewalk system out there. The traffic moves fast. There are homes there that have their own backyards. There's one apartment complex that does have their own basketball court, swimming pool, clubhouse. You know, so some of the some of those uh, apartment centers they do have their own facilities. Um, but on, it's the opposite on Northgate, where it's it's uh, it's just it's grown up, been built up with no facilities for these people and resulting in Northgate being like the default park right on the other side of freeway. So I just wanted to throw that out there and just make sure you guys are hearing, hearing the neighbors out there. Oh, uh, I'd like to follow up on what Jose is asking about. Courtney, how then, uh, if, if we're moved by this discussion, okay, one way or the other, how, what's the process now for us to say, you know, we want this to be we want to focus this investment on Northgate Park, whether it's restrooms or whatever else is needed out there. How does Jose proceed or any of us proceed uh, to, to kind of make that happen? What's the process here? Well, we would take your recommendations today and that would give us some time to cost it out and see what happens to the rest of the um, parks um, current costs associated with the parks portion of that pie we were discussing earlier. Um, so if, if there are specific ideas, I, when I was at Northgate, I didn't hear any specific ideas related to park improvement, but if there are specific ideas, we can certainly reach out and gather those. Um, but right now, the way the list is constructed, it gets us to that $35 million piece of the parks improvement pie. So if we, you're, it's, it's up to you to decide what, as collectively, whether you wanna recommend a Northgate park improvement in addition to, um, which would just make one of the other pieces smaller, or if you wanna make 
a recommendation for a Northgate Park improvement in, in to, and take something else out. You know, this is the part where we have an opportunity to really discuss what pieces are important to include in the overarching measure. And certainly to direct staff to do more work in one area or another, that's what we're here for today. So we can take that away and come back next time. Thank you, okay. Courtney, and thank you, Mayor. I, and the reason I mentioned it is it goes with that marketing piece, you know, to go back, to take this back and get support from the neighbor. That's why I'm bringing this up. You know, I'm trying to see where we're going to be able to get the support. So thank you. Well, Jose, would you like to have them take another look at this Northgate for a restroom or, or, or anything? Are those the kinds of things you'd like to have them look at or are you comfortable where they are at this point? I definitely would like for them to look at it only because okay. the feedback I've been getting is neighbors have had to open up their houses to allow kids to go to the bathroom when they host those events, especially on Friday evenings, 400 people. And with yeah. COVID, that became nearly impossible. And just to see those those um, Mexican mothers out there, you should see them um, trying to get engaged. And just what they're asking for is, you know, just it's just really it's really nice to see. So I want to support them. Yeah. Does that, Courtney, have you captured that then? Okay. Yes, I have. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, Councillor Stapleton made a point of discussing parking lots. And I don't know, Virginia, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, we're, we're now getting a look at it. Is there something you'd like to have done there or what are you yeah. thinking? Yeah, actually, I have two questions on this one. I would like to see, um, I was talking with um, Dylan McDowell about this um, yesterday and, and they were talking about, can we see what the cost would be for traditional pavement versus pervious pavement so that we can make sure that runoff is not, you know, we're not creating more of a runoff issue. So I'd like to talk about material for any kind of parking lots that we um, want to put in. But I also want to really lean into this idea that I'm, I really don't think that parking lots should be, especially in a priority one location on this list. And I, and I, and of course I'm not a parks planner, so I don't hear from the public all the time all from across the spectrum. So I don't understand the need um, like you do. Uh, but you know, when we're hearing from folks, I definitely heard about Minto Brown's um, parking lot there for the, the dog park, right? That made sense to me. Um, but the rest of them, I hadn't really heard anything, um, you know, uh, obviously again, not everywhere and hearing everything, but. I would love to take that six and a half million and put it towards, you know, uh, like parks that Jose was just talking about, getting those structures in, getting the, the bathrooms or whatever they need, um, some more play structures for kids around. Um, that's when I think parks, I don't think parking lots. I think parks and park structures, um, you know, and so that's that's where I'm at on that one. Do you uh, on that question, because it, it is I, I know for a neighborhood park parking lots you wouldn't think of, okay? But when you look at these regional parks where people drive in uh, with their kids to play, I, I, when I look at this, I often wonder if we're not applying, if we're applying equity lens, if we're being fair, where people use, like Deer Park has certain kinds of, of activities that demand people drive in. Uh, you can't just walk into Gear Park. Uh, that is not possible. Or Wallace Marine is very, very difficult to just walk into. Uh, and and it, it, there may be expectations. Uh, do you see maybe that kind of park getting a little more parking lot, less, but, but not some of the others? I, I'm not sure how best to balance that. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You know, we have definitely community parks that serve a different purpose than a neighborhood park, for sure. Um, I, I feel like we as a society um, don't- of Our users, I'm thinking of our users, Virginia, not, not a broad generalization, just like mom and pop trying to take the kids to the ball game. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm saying is I understand that we have different parks that require different things, right? And when you have a park like Gear Park or Wallace Marine that function as more community parks, therefore drawing in people who are maybe a little bit farther than walking distance away from the park, that we would need to provide some kind of parking for those cars. Um, but I don't, I don't look at it as an equity lens thing per se, because oh, yeah. as a society, 
we dote on the folks who drive cars a lot. We have a lot of infrastructure for cars already, and we've really um, neglected the infrastructure for people who are walking and people who are choosing to bike. So for me, uh, when we bring up equity in this conversation, I kind of see it on the opposite side of the spectrum that we really need to get more equity into the folks who are biking, who are riding transit, who are choosing to walk. Um, those to me are the underserved modes of transportation in our park system and, and citywide. Yeah, I, I, we're think, looking at equity quite differently. So uh, that'll be, I guess, a different discussion. Um, so what do you want to do about parking lots, Virginia? You want to move the money? I mean, we, that's what we're getting down to here. Are you thinking you'd like them to staff to pull something together based on the idea of this park needs some parking lots, this park doesn't, or how would you like to have the staff respond to your, or do you want to just see if the votes are there? Well, I would love to um, personally uh, have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with staff to really understand the need better. And I'm not sure if, if other people feel the same way, but for me personally, I need to understand the need for these different parking lot, um, you know, redos um, so that I can get behind it. You know, I, I need to be uh, more educated here. And then secondly, I would love to see what it would look like if the parking um, were moved down in priority and some of the other park uh, you know, amenities were moved up in priority. I think that would be um, something that I'd like to see. And then also um, just out there, I would like to make sure the materials that we're losing, if that's going to um, using, if we're going to change materials to something that's more um, environmentally friendly, what that does to the price, because I think that that does Something change that. the price. Yeah. So I guess three parts is what I'm, I'm looking for there. Okay. Kristen, could you spend time with Councillor Stapleton, with whoever from your staff you need to get there? recognize Absolutely. this is not universal this is this is uh, the counselor's point of view and we'll be talking about it in the we, future certainly we can do that as well as um prepare the cost estimate for northgate park okay uh, wrap our, our our minds around that and i think um work with staff to prioritize which of those parking lots, if there were to be a trade-off, which of those parking lots they would deem as the most necessary or higher priority to serve yeah. the public. Yeah, okay. That'd be really helpful. I think it'd give, it'd give Virginia a chance to really explore this deeply with you guys. Uh, and I think looking at the various kinds of uh, uh, product you use to build parking lots. I, I've heard it so many different ways over the years. I'd be really intrigued what the answer is to her question on uh, what you pave it with. Okay, so that part will get worked on and you'll bring something back to us in that parking lot area, the Northgate area. Is there anything anyone else wants to have looked at in this parks area so that we can at our next meeting really try to lock this one down and move it forward? Chris has his hand raised. I can't see him. I've got a spreadsheet on my, there we go. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I wanted to actually ask, not necessarily specific about the parks, but more about the scoring process that staff used. I would like to understand it. Just it would be helpful to to know how like how you got what the equity score means, what the you know, I think it says ward or somewhere it says formula and ranking. And just I would just like to hear more about like how those scores um, were, de were derived so we could that would help us understand why they are where they are. Okay, so sure, you'll bring us a staff report on how you scored them. We could certainly do that. Your methodology. I, did I you don't use necessarily our, staff did you use our CIP hoping. scoring system or what did you use? Yeah, this, this used the CIP scoring system. Okay. So in the different categories, you know, for example, uh, uh, parks, we've got... Well, yeah, we, we got about eight different categories and they're all weighted and, and uh, equity and uh, okay. is, is one of the categories. And so when you look at that score, equity is actually a subcomponent of the overall score. Okay. We just separated it out because we thought it'd be of interest. And, and Does that sound okay, Chris? I mean, will that be enough information? To I was just hoping for a, quick, a brief explanation of it. I don't need to Are you just, That's I all just, you want? I was just hoping to understand what, how the scores were derived. CIP. Yeah. So... 
So Brian, maybe what you could do is just the, the overall score that's listed there is directly a CIP score. So that, that makes the projects ready to slip into the CIP should they be funded through this bond measure. Okay. The equity score is one that is part of the CIP and it's traditionally and historically been referred to as a Title VI score. Okay. And so Brian, do you want to explain a little bit more about the income and um, other socioeconomic status pieces that go into that? Yeah, it, I mean, it really looks at, at what you're saying and, and uh, we have kind of it mapped in the city where, you know, the lower income areas are. And, and uh, so really when we looked at these projects, those are the things that we looked at was we had the map, which kind of derives those same title six issues. So okay. lower income areas typically would score higher with the equity. Thank you, Brian. And then as you move further to the right, um, we tried to identify those things that have been part of the conversation in, in these previous conversations when we've been discussing things that are important criteria that would be important. So you'll notice we, we tried to highlight where there was an ADA improvement associated with a particular project. You'll see that occurring as well in the transportation side. So we like to use kind of short language. We say things like urban upgrade, and we felt that it was important to help you see and the community see where we that meant an ADA improvement, a sidewalk improvement, a bike lane ad, just to kind of help you see where we were getting some of those other benefits that um, we've been talking about in our time together. So that's what you'll see. And master plan is really just a way to kind of get at a readiness characterization because um, for us to make a, a park improvement or a street improvement, it has to be something that's already that's in a master plan or get into a master plan really, really quick so that we can fund it in that 10 year cycle that we're looking forward to. Okay, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just following up. So could it help me understand then how the let's say I'm just looking at, say, um, Orchard Heights, Orchard Heights Park. Um, the sports field has an equity score of 7.2 but the shelter for the same park has an equity score of 10.2. So help me understand how that works. That's a great question. I'm, I see the parking lot. I'm looking for the sports. It's at the bottom. It's the last uh, row on that page, on page 23. Very I'm bottom. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very I see last it. one. Yeah, I, I don't know why that's different. It looks like it should be the same. I think that might be an error on the table. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a um, sort of limited time together. I wonder if we might just introduce the transportation, the sidewalks and streets projects. And um, we'll take your feedback that we've gotten so far on, on parks and make some adjustments. But if we could introduce the other um, layout and, and the lists, I I think that would be useful just to get a couple of reactions so that we know how to modify for the next conversation. Okay. And that's page what, 20? Which one is it? No. Yes. What page are we? Yes, page, Mayor. Page 20? Two zero, yes. Yeah, okay. Well. I think one issue on the uh, on the transportation, um, and I'd just be real interested by from anyone else. I really feel strongly if we don't get that Marine Drive issue off the table, get that project done or funded to be completed, uh, we're going to lose this bond measure because we're going to lose West Salem in very large numbers. I'm, I'm really concerned about that. So I view that as an above the line. It's almost a, a necessity to get that included into this thing, just to, uh, it, this has gone on for way too many years, this uh, discussion over, and I realize a lot's been done. We've been buying property, we've been moving right along and all the rest of it. I think the perception is that it, uh, it it isn't going to get built, and I think that's what this is. This needs to resolve that issue over there. It, it, it definitely is the most expensive project we had on the list, and and you know all the projects are important. We had put this one below the line just because of the cost. We can certainly yeah, move I it know. up, 
and uh, you know try and figure out what we may want to move down in order to get it up. Uh, we were really trying to cover as many categories as we could, and I, I just think this one has such a, a uh, an impact on the west side of the river that uh, to lose a block over there, I, I really believe we would. Um, now I, I can certainly be corrected or, uh, but I, I think this one is really essential. It's got a lot of factors in it. It, uh, it improves the relationship of that area with the park. It solves a, a big chunk of traffic. It creates a new bike path. It gives a, a really excellent uh, uh, access to the park for part of the community. It just resolves a lot of issues. Plus it's been promised I mean, I think we're at probably 20 years now and it's still kind of moving slowly along. And uh, it just feels like one we just need to get done. So and it, it just gets more expensive over time. So the sooner yeah. it's it done, the less it'll, it'll cost, even though it's expensive now. Oh, no, I know. And but it's it's also just a political problem. It is just straight up a political problem on the West Side. So I don't know. Yeah, Chris. So following up on uh, your comments, Mr. Mayor, I, you know, we had a whole task force to look at congestion relief and we identified a series of things that would help relieve uh, congestion in the part of the town where we thought we felt it was important to do so. And basically we prioritized them and said, okay, as soon as we get the money, we're going to, we're going to start doing these projects. Well, that's what this is. Yeah. So to me, it's, we need to, we need to follow through with that commitment. I mean, I know there were other counselors at that time, but it just seems like as a priority for the city, and we've been, certainly been going in that direction by buying right of way. And right. I think the current council is uh, still behind that concept. So to me, it, it it has to be an above the line project. We can't, I understand it's, it's really, uh, you know, it's a big chunk of money, but it, that's just the way it is. Yeah, thank you, counselor. You represent the area of Virginia. What do you think? Yeah, like I mentioned before, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with Chris on this, and I and I think also it is going to open up access to a lot of affordable housing over there, which is another key issue in the city. And so, again, and the bike and uh, pedestrian infrastructure for West Salem, this is really going to be key to that. Um, so I'm I'm all for um, that being above the line. Um, it is huge, and um, I think that. It's going to take us communicating with the folks who are not in that area why this is so important. And so um, I'm there uh, with you guys. I did have some questions on the on the rest of this. Uh, well, I have two questions, um, and they're both re like thirty thousand feet. Um, one of them is more of a statement now that I'm thinking about it. I haven't had enough time to think this through. Like I, you know, I looked at parks because it was something that I could wrap my head around. Uh, transportation infrastructure, that is something that is a whole nother ballgame. So I'm going to need more time to digest this information. But the one question that I did mark down real quick was the sidewalk infill that we have on that on page 20, um, which is, is great that it's a priority one project. Um, and it's great that it's seven and a half million. Um, but I need to know where those are going to go. And I, so are the people who are going to vote for this. Because the people who are really passionate about fixing the sidewalks, they're, you know, they're, they're really passionate about that. I know, uh, Mr. Mayor, you're in the same area of town as me, Chris and Jose, you guys know it too. Our areas are really desperate for those repairs um, to the sidewalks and, and even getting some sections of sidewalk in uh, to make it safer for folks who are walking. Yeah, that's, that's really good. So what you're feeling is, uh, is on this part, I think what, what Courtney's asking, you join in moving uh, the um, Marine Drive above the line. So we'd like you to do that for our next report. And then in this one, I, I agree with uh, Virginia, of course, that's part of living in Northeast Salem is we need to, we really do need to have at least a sense of where repaired and new sidewalks would occur. What's that look like uh, in terms of uh, uh, how it's spread across the community, how it's focused? I don't know what it is, but I think without seeing that, um, 
and 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 maybe it's just taking the time to read real carefully what you've written for us uh, is it, just making sure we've got a real good sense of what's going on there. Yeah, Chris. Uh, thank you. I would also like to just uh, advocate for uh, Fisher Road. And I know that there's a part of Fisher Road on here, but it's uh, the I think that that's the part north of Silverton Road. I'm advocating for south of Silverton Road to Sunnyview and actually about 100 feet south of Sunnyview where we made that great new section, but we didn't finish the job because we didn't have the money for it. I would love to see at least the part where Fisher Road connects to Silver or Sunnyview Road from the south on this list. That's a very small project, but it's important for to make that earlier investment actually meaningful. Right now you have a, just a narrow little piece of pavement with with no sidewalks or anything that goes for about 100 i don't know how many feet 100 feet maybe and then you have a beautiful brand new uh bike lanes and everything yeah and and are you looking at that chris on the uh seven and a half million dollar that infill portion if you wouldn't mind mayor the the uh the Fisher Road project actually starts just north of Market Street and goes all the way up to Silverton Road. So I think it's covered. Oh, it does. Yes. So, oh, excellent. Because that the, so the Silverton Road northeast slash east west curve is that what that means? Where is that, Brian? I'm on page twenty, second line from the bottom. Oh, okay. It's under urban upgrades. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was looking under sidewalk. Sorry. I read that as a different portion, so maybe I just misunderstood. Yeah, we could clarify. It's that it's that east-west curve just north of uh, Market Street by the car dealership. Oh, great. That's that's exactly what I was talking about. Finishing that 100 feet of road that we didn't get to finish when we yep. upgraded the other part of it. Cool. Okay, I didn't know that was that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, is that is there... enough? Courtney, is that enough to... Yes, that's um, that's a lot of helpful information. Thank you so much. Um, I have just sort of a, a radical suggestion that I didn't ask anybody about before I'm about to make it. Um, you know, we're as we're considering whether or how to add um, another 47 million of uh, streets and sidewalks into the bond package. My immediate question is just. Um, I, I get stuck in the morass of need and I have no way to, to imagine myself moving forward. And so I wanted to just ask uh, casually about the overarching scope of our bond measure, which is sort of where we started. And remember the 300 million is, is the um, way forward without changing tax rates. So 300 million feels to us like the absolute ceiling. And so the question is, how do we build that 300 million? We're currently uh, looking at 26 million for fire trucks and equipment, which is an urgent need in terms of time frame. Yeah. Then we had another 15 million we were imagining for some sort of affordable housing and sheltering. We had 150, which we would exceed if we add the 47, or we would take projects away and stay at that 150. Um, we had another 35 for parks and recreation equipment. We had 15 for the IT component. We had 45 for the Civic Center seismic upgrade. Josh, I'm imagining there there's a pie <laughs> appearing in front of us um, so we can see that really quickly. Um, and then there's another 14 for that fire stations. And this does not get to that other conversation about how we consider acquisition potentially to include a, a future branch library sites. And so if you just look at this for a second, yep. my, um, I'm not asking for a decision, but I do wonder if you, how much time we should invest in getting that 150 million streets and sidewalks, leaving it at 150 million and taking out those other pieces to, to stay at 150 million, but accommodate rain drive. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. I think you ought to. I think you ought to look at how you would like to adjust some of these other pieces. I'll just mention uh, the Civic Center did very poorly, if I recall correctly, on the uh, public reaction. I hate saying this, but I just wonder if it isn't in there somewhere. A big chunk of it is in there. 
Uh, $45 million for the Civic is the second largest piece of that pie. Uh, and, and I understand the problem. I, I, I really do. But uh, I wonder if that isn't one place to look, a very, look, look at it very, very, very closely. Yeah, Chris. And I, 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 I agree with that sentiment. And also, I was wondering um, if we if we commit to uh, to say Marine Drive with this bond, are there potential other um, uh, revenue streams that might come to uh, yeah. come to the forefront that might offset that cost rather than? And I'm, I'm wondering because of the uh, you know just other. You know, all of the ARPA money or whatever the, the money that's coming in, build back better or whatever all these programs are from the federal government, it's, there might be a way to maximize that with the building of Marine Drive. Also, I'm wondering about the cybersecurity part of it um, in terms of are there some, like as when Krishna mentioned having a second location, is there something in some sort of emergency funds for resiliency? I think there are a lot of, you know, there could be some options there for other funding sources. So just just a couple of questions or thoughts. Yeah, I think that would be, that's really good is, is if you guys could do kind of your expert analysis of this looks like it might have the most likely uh, potential for alternative resources, whether state, federal, um, you know, there, there, are, there are ways to pay for these things in other ways if we set our mind to it. Are that what would be the best places to go? Transportation. We've just had a heck of a time getting additional money for some of these transportation projects. I just keep watching McGilchrist get bounced year after year after year, and it's an extraordinarily important project. Completely right now, it seems like dependent on federal support, and I hate to see that. You know. I, can we find this stuff in other places? Uh, that'd be the, the issue to me. Yes, and, and I would just say that I think the reason we have the composition we have today in that pie is a reflection of those types of projects that have not been successful in other funding sources. And so we are already kind of at that stage. These are the, the projects that are, are not... Um, doing well in other fund sources. And we are really scrappy to, to your point. We've been I really know. successful in some ways. So, so, so yes, um, it, we, the, the package is comprised the way it is because they, these are unlikely to be successful. And I know in the transportation project list, Brian, that was one of the calculations that your team was making is, is, um, and in the parks too, on the CDC, SDC opportunities, you know, we were already using that lens. What things do we, are we going to be relying on this bond, bond fund source for? Okay. Virginia? Yeah, um, thank you. This is where I get super frustrated because the need is so great. And I understand that, you know, the city is really running a tight ship and um, God, I want all these projects to go, right? Um, and so my concern lately has been this, and I've heard it a few times, is that this kind of promise to the community that we won't come back and ask for more for a decade. And for me, that makes me feel kind of shaky because I'm not sure that's true, right? All of these things are really important and we are strapped for cash on every front. And to say, we're going to ask for this much, it's not going to increase your taxes and we're not going to come talk to you for another 10 years, um, to me, I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure that's responsible of us to say, to make that promise that we're not going to come back. I guess that's what I want to say is that that part is like a, a step too far for me personally, because what if something happens and we do need to come back to the voters? I don't want to make that promise and then break it, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, don't start. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Try not to Present it as your plan is to break it. Uh, that's the main thing. I mean, there are emergencies and, and that kind of thing can certainly come up. Uh, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I think really, Courtney, what, what I'd really suggest you, you guys take a very close look at the Civic Center portion and look at setting it 
below the line in order to get this other stuff above the line. Uh, it, they're just, I think it's a drag on this bond measure anyway at this point, if I understood the polling correctly. If I didn't, correct me at either now or later. Uh, but otherwise, I think that's the one that we have the hardest time moving. Second to that is IT. Whether we agree or, and I really disagree with not staying current in that. Uh, but uh, what's going to drag us down and what's going to move us forward on getting this pass? We've got to have that fire equipment. Uh, we desperately need these transportation projects. I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. Understood. I think we'll we'll take another crack at this and bring you some okay. options at the next meeting. I feel compelled. Just sorry. Are you? Um, oh, go ahead, Courtney, yeah. and then, then I want to. Well, ask. I was gonna. I think I'm gonna share what you're sharing. Um, oh, I no, I, I have something related to this first to share. Okay. Okay. Um, I I think we should look at the 28th for the next meeting, and then next week have staff do this additional work and then be available for follow-up questions. I know Councillor Stapleton has a number of questions. Right. Um, if anybody else has questions, we can look at some uh, smaller meetings to talk with staff so where we can get into some greater detail on some of these projects. So you're saying you'll update this spreadsheet or whatever you're going to update by next week so that counselors will have time to to, to follow it and follow up with you? Is that what you're saying? I think we'll have the spreadsheet updated towards the end of next week in preparation for a meeting the 28th. And as we're updating it to also make time available to talk with counselors, because it's I, we're gonna okay. need a couple days, Monday and Tuesday to run some of these number and make some changes. And so what's, the what's the 28th? What's the meeting look like you want the 28th? Just us meeting again, this yes, meeting again? Yes, yes, So This is not for the council. No, so between, right, so between now and the 28th, we will update the spreadsheet. We will share that with council and be available for meetings with council members to dive into some of these questions when it, with more detail. Well... I think you're making a mistake not having another meeting of this group to, to make sure we're fully teasing out the various issues that are going to be on. If this is all that's on the table, I get it, but I that, assume there's more to come. This would be the meeting on the 28th to tease this out further. Tease it out further. This group, okay. With this group. Okay. okay. Yes. We're, we're, whole, we're looking at a 12 to 2 on Monday the 28th as an opportunity to regroup. And um, and and look through adjustments that staff will have made. What would week. your expectation of us be then? What what are you expecting counselors to be prepared to do on the twenty eighth? The the closer we can get to a recommended package, the sooner the the more time we'll have to really talk with the community about the package and educate people about what's in the package and start messaging and, and then we can do a polling to see how it's going, adjust our tactics and then aim for um, an August. Uh, we have to file in August for the November. And so, so really it's, it's taking the opportunity to get things um, as quick as we can together so that we're messaging to the voters, this is what you would be buying, getting that uh, something everybody's talking about and, and then see how well we're polling and pivot, change, get in for uh, an August package. So on the 28th, we'd be looking for a sem semi-baked. Semi-baked? Semi would, yeah. uh, would you expect us to begin moving pieces of this into the we're done column? Done like column. parks, we're done. Yes. Transportation, we're yes. done. Yes. So, yeah. chart, we're done. So, I mean, what so are my, yeah. So my hope would be that if next week we're able to modify the list and get that back out to the committee okay. and have some one-on-one -on -one meetings to answer some questions okay. that when we reconvene on the 28th, we are able to take some categories and say, okay, we're, we're green on these. 
you know, we're taking some of these and, and moving them to the done site conversations about maybe some of the harder projects. Or, to or at least alert us in advance where there are, you know, where changes would be made. I mean, I think part of it is we don't want to do this, readjust this whole list one counselor at a time. It's kind of get this to where we can look at it as a group and see where the majority of the group is, not just I'm against this one and that one suddenly pops out and it, it probably at least deserves a discussion by the full group. Okay. And then also just as we're making those choices in that having that conversation, we can look at how the package as a whole performs yeah. um, for uh, meeting needs in a whole bunch of different areas of the community, as well as the overarching package, how it performs against climate and equity and those other things. And so we can do that together when we meet next time. Okay, well, what I'm interested in doing together next time is getting pieces onto the list mm -hmm. so we can get this thing done in advance of your August date that everybody has a chance to, and we can start looking around for people who are actually gonna support this ballot measure. Uh, right now, it's pretty hard to get people involved because you don't know what's in it yet. You know, that'll be the... Uh, I also hope that you will have some sort of recommendation that we can act on, some sort of action recommendation around uh, whether it's co-location or it's some other plan around uh, uh, these library, this library issue that Mr. Shepke has been raising. Uh, I think there's real interest in it, but what's that look like? What do you, how do you see that coming together? Where would that be in this package? And that's a new addition. I mean, that's a new piece, but how could you do it and not raise our, our bond costs or if you can? Yes, and that's where I think maybe we can show you some options. Yeah, that'd be great. I think that'd be really helpful. That's a way to get that issue into this discussion. But if you find it has to be discrete, you know, that the library locations need to be discrete because it'll be based on leasing or some other more operational costs than through the bond measure, we need to know that too. How, how do you see approaching that issue? Does that make sense? Yes. Virginia, Chris, is that, is that okay? Okay. Um, so if, if I could just, I'm gonna make a radical change in subjects um, and topics for, for you all. Um, I'd like you to be aware that um, we are, there's a shelter in place order for downtown. Um, there was um, a shooting incident and we are not looking at an active shooter, but we are um, seeking out the suspect. And so that happened at High Street in Chemeketa. You should have an email from Chief Womack, but that's been going on while we've been in this conversation. And I just wanna make sure you, you are aware if you've signed up for Marion Polk Alerts, you would have also gotten emails and, and yeah. texts and phone I calls. I feel it buzzing in my pocket yeah. anyway. <laughs> That's what that is, yes. And so oh. we're, we're expecting police to give more information to the community as soon as they've um, taken care of the suspect, have the suspect in custody. So we've given- What does, that do, what does that do to us here at City Hall? We're, we're locked down. Doors are currently locked at Civic. They're locked at Housing Authority. They're locked at Urban Development. Uh, okay. Salmon Run should be locked as well. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Well, great. Anything else for the good of the order? Is there anything else you want to have at our next meeting? I mean, you want the staff to- are we covering what we need to cover? Okay. So, okay. Councillor Stapleton, I'll have Tammy reach out regarding scheduling a meeting. If anybody else would like to meet next week, please let me know and we'll get something scheduled. Very good. Thank you very much, Kristen. Okay. Thank then you everyone are... for your time. That was, that was very insightful. Thank you all for your time and patience.